Hello and welcome everyone. Welcome everyone who has joined for Horace's Asia Meet for our panel, Progression Towards Cashless Societies. If I ask any of you right now who is listening to this uh, uh, panel that if you are carrying 100 euro worth of cash in your pocket, I kind of know the answer, but I'm also not surprised. In April 2020, uh, two months into pandemic, when PayPal broke the news that the fastest growing segment for March and April 2020 were demography of 50 year olds. Uh, the people who had no experience in mobile transactions were the biggest adopters during this time. Uh, Australia reported one third of cash transactions which disappeared in Q2 2021. In India, my parents had their purchase of uh, daily milk and snacks done by online subscription and saw the first adoption to what we call cashless society. Still, the question remains, is that a good thing? I'm not, it's not some, something obscure, hypothetical, but for a considerable amount of time, um, economies have been pulling out from the use of cash. And cashless society is also seen as a natural progression of technology. Uh, we don't use gold or goats to trade. And if technology makes it better, then what is harm in embracing this change? Even if we all agree on cashless society from consumer perspective, there's another elephant in the room called merchant fees. And what do we do with the unbanked people? Maybe replicate El Salvador example? where 70% did not have bank accounts, and now they have Bitcoin wallets or central bank digital currency. To provoke us with such thoughts and answer, answer such questions, I'm very glad that we have a panel today of extremely experienced people who would be presenting their views. So we have the panelists, all of them here, and without taking further time, I would uh, say first, say, Matthias, to introduce yourself and share your perspectives with us okay. can i be heard always a good thing yes. all right so quick introduction on me i come from stockholm sweden from beginning a long long time ago nowadays i spend my time between silicon valley and the canary islands um i didn't like the cold in the north so i went south um, I started my career as a scientist in electromagnetic wave structures. We don't have to go there because nobody, I don't do that anymore. I ended up in computer science like everybody else. And there I have invented about 80 different patent claims inside the field of network and decentralization for management of computer assets. And that's pretty much about me. I do advise governments and Fortune 500 companies on technological um, solutions and possibilities. Um, that's probably my big job more than anything else today. Science has become less. All right. So I will now quickly jump over to cashless society. And to make one thing clear, I am all for technology. I think that should be pretty clear by my introduction. It's not like I go like, yeah, technology. I'm not a lot it here, right? So we would say, I believe technology solves most things because if we didn't have technology, we would still be living in caves, right? And uh, it is technology that has made the progress. It might be the entrepreneurs that are the agent for change, but it is the technology that brings us forward, right? So we have two parts there. You need the entrepreneur to move it forward, but you need the technology to have something to move forward. Right? <laughs> but if we talk then about the idea of cashless, it's a really, really complex system because first of all, when people talk about it, they do it at a very high level. But if you look at it from a bottom up, you're basing it on the internet. So you have to start with what's the internet layers? What's the communication layers? Where does that start? Who owns that? Right, because if you if you're giving this to um, private companies to run your whole infrastructure that all the payments are done over, you're doing a very risky proposition, right? Because you're saying, okay, not only do 
we change into cashless society. We are under the control of the companies who own the underlying infrastructure because if they break, nobody can go shopping anymore. Right? So it's not just about the payment system. It's having a reliable underlying infrastructure. That can, of course, be achieved in many different ways from technology, but trusting the internet in its current form to be that underlying infrastructure is probably not a good proposition. I have written a lot of papers about that, so I'm not going to go into too much detail on that. Uh, the, the point being that access to the internet as controlled by commercial entities is always going to have a risk. What if that guy goes bankrupt? What if he wants to limit somebody's speed? What if they can't pay their monthly fees so they can't all of a sudden use their online wallet or whatever it is, right? We have a lot, a bunch of infrastructural problems before we even get to the cashless part. Right. So there is like then we can discuss the whole thing, crypto versus digital payments. Digital, that That's like that's like up here when we haven't even started solving what's below that. Right. So as I come from Scandinavia, of course, I use the cashless payments because in Sweden it has existed for a long time. We have a ID system where you get an identification code when you are born. So there's nothing, you have it for the rest of your life. You get it when you're born and you have it. And we have a digital system with that for practically everything. Point is in Sweden, the infrastructure is government controlled, right? We don't have, it's uh, called the snake. Interestingly enough, the infrastructure in Sweden, don't ask me why. Um, and it is under government control. So the infrastructure the commercial players rent into an infrastructure facilitated by the government. So there is always going to be an access as long as the government allows it. That's, of course, becomes the next problem. Can we trust governments? And then we're into the next infrastructure problem. So I, my biggest concern when it comes to cashless, when I discuss this in different areas of the world, is really the point of how not all the fantastic things cashless can do for us, because that's amazing. We all know the opportunities, right? But understanding the underlying problems with this, and we brought up inclusiveness. Of course, inclusiveness is also a problem here. If you can't pay these guys who own the infrastructure, how are you even going to access this? You might have a phone, but how, how are you going to get internet if you... I mean, the device doesn't solve the issue here, right? You have a monthly payment just to be able to do your payment. It's like, is it cost of making business? Is it, you know, it, it's, th there's a lot of question about the underlying infrastructure that I am spending more of my time looking at than the solutions that are, you know, the layer above, if we call it that. I think that would be my first input into this um, yeah, that, that's my base thoughts about where we are yeah. with cashless societies. Thanks. Thanks, Matthias. Yeah, we'll, we'll get back with, with some questions. That was quite thought-provoking. And uh, Sherry, maybe you should be... Yeah. So we talk about payment systems and, uh, uh, and uh, financial inclusion. So maybe, Sherry, that would be your area to explore. Thank you, and uh, thank you for, for joining us in this uh, discussion. Um, I'm Sherry. I'm based in Singapore. I'm the founder of Planner B. It's a fintech app made for Gen Z and uh, millennials in Asia. We're operating in six different Asian countries at the moment. Um, so my background has always been in business and as a serial entrepreneur, um, I've been in the personal finance space for more than a decade. Um, so talking about financial inclusion might be, um, my scope might be quite limited being based out of Singapore, but being surrounded by countries like Indonesia, Philippines and Thailand and China, I've seen a lot of changes on how um, the internet has brought about financial inclusion. And now with COVID, um, a lot of things have changed on how people make, make and receive payments. Um, so I, I guess... I think as um, 
as what I've noticed, I think like everyone else, um, developing countries are seeing people leaping from being unbanked um, by a traditional bank to owning e-wallets and virtual bank accounts only. And these people don't know how a check even looks like and regard their mobile phones as a walking bank branch. Of course, the, there are limitations to those um, services that they get, um, but it's it's really um, surprising to see people in China where they trust Tencent, Alibaba, to do, that dominates the payment uh, services, um, to trust them more than traditional FIs. Um, yeah, and and I think financial inclusion is is a lot easier now for three reasons. Um, uh, like what Mateus has just also dropped up, um, you know, mentioned about the mobile and the mobile and internet penetration is is a huge uh, underlying reason. Um, and the interesting thing with COVID is, with that, we've seen more than forty million people coming online for the first time in the region, and that brings the proportion of populations connected to the internet to seventy percent. And however, on the flip side, it's estimated that only 73% of people in the same area are unbanked. It's, it's actually a, a direct opposite. It's really stuck. Um, although I don't, I don't have the deep knowledge to, to run through why there are, there are, um, we're seeing the stats like this. Um, but I think one of the reasons is that they are only starting to see online penetration being available as a service for both sides of the marketplace, sellers and buyers. Um, in places in rural Philippines, people are still transacting in cash um, pre-COVID, and that has been very convenient because they don't see a bank branch. If you ask them what their account numbers are, they might give you their debit card numbers on the, on, 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 on the card. They don't know the differences. Um, so with the rise of e-wallets, it enables them with just a mobile phone and it actually forces them um, to, to actually create a mobile marketplace for themselves or even a livelihood because um, people are now transacting online. They can sell their services online, their products online. And this actually, um, it is encouraging them to transit to that behavior directly from being unbanked, just adopting an e-wallet. Um, and this enables both a cashless society um, and on financial inclusion for those who are unbankable with no prior data, no credit score, and no regular income. Um, the adoption has also been accelerated to sellers that uh, would like to continue their businesses as a result of COVID forcing the shutdown. Um, but with the e-wallets available and services available connected to the e-wallet, again, infrastructure and push from multiple players, adoption of sellers and shopping platforms push that shifts that shift further um, and it's also um, easy for some people to forget especially me in Singapore where we are so small that uh, the adoption is not limited to physical bank branches in these countries where some people have to travel two hours just to get an ATM branch to get cash um, and the third thing about um, cash to society is often mentioned now cryptocurrency um, the jump again for many Gen Z and millennials that we speak to these days, they don't go investing in stocks or mutual funds or unit trust. Their first thing could be buying a Bitcoin, owning a Bitcoin, um, buying a Dogecoin because it's fun or having an NFT. Um, and many, they look into that as their first investment vehicle now. Um, although this use case is still in the early stages, there's a lot of potential for blockchain to inc increase financial inclusion for the poor because it's trackable. Um, however, there's so many major limitations in these services, such as lending, which is a huge um, important service for finance. Um, it's necessary for that service to allow people to own their homes and vehicles for their livelihoods. But these services are still dominated by traditional banks. So a suggestion um, that is, um, is being passed around is data sharing between the players should be made available and acceptable for people to prove their credit scores to these services when you need. Um, but I think um, this, this has to have a huge push from the government bodies for, for these to, to happen um, and allow the poor to access their basic needs through the services that's available, either through traditional banks or the expansion of virtual banks. Yeah. 
So, um, yeah, that's some info for today. And um, yeah, I think Kamal has some, some things to share about uh, cryptocurrency and, and payment services. Sure. Yeah, th thanks, Shari. We will we'll get with more questions. Uh, yes, and uh, we talk about this uh, payment systems for the post-COVID world and uh, digital transformation is also a word we hear. And now I'm compelled to ask uh, Kamalis to introduce herself and share your views. Thank you and good morning, good afternoon. Hello, everyone. It is really a pleasure to join you here today. So I am the CEO of Ladin Partner Consulting, which is a boutique firm based here in Zurich, Switzerland. And we basically specialize in digital business transformation and emerging technology solutions. Over the past 21 years, I have advised companies across industries and regions on how to leverage technology to accelerate business performance and strategic outcomes. Um, I'm also a teaching fellow, so I've taught at several different universities, and currently I am a teaching fellow at the Business School in um, the UK. I'm also the chair of the Forbes Business Council Women Executives Group and a board member of the World uh, Innovation and Change Management Institute here in Geneva. Um, I have to say I am basically a business futurist and a technology optimist. So I, I think, um, you know, coming from the perspective of advising uh, businesses and how to engage better uh, in terms of uh, utilizing digital technologies, I believe that there is a positive transformative impact of technology uh, on the global business landscape and on our lives in general. So over the past decade or so, we've seen technology gradually disrupt the business world and change the way companies create, capture and deliver value in the market. And of course, the coronavirus pandemic, it served as a complete shock to the business system and it further accelerated disruption in almost every industry that we can think of. And this really triggered a fundamental change in the behavior of global consumer base. Because within a few short weeks, consumption patterns um, we have relied on for decades suddenly shifted towards an acceleration of adoption of online and digital channels for interaction, communication, as well as acquisitions. So the global consumer base have become very accustomed to interacting with digitally enabled businesses. And these are basically companies that very quickly scaled on the basis of using um, digital technologies and online channels. And they offer hyper-personalized, instantaneous and seamless interactions. And so now consumers expect the same level of interaction from every brand that they are engaging with online. And um, digital payments and online acquisitions have also accelerated during the pandemic prompting traditional companies and retailers to improve their e-commerce offerings, access and user friendliness to respond to this increase in online shopping. Now, Asia Pacific is really considered one of the world leaders in cashless transactions with predicted average annual growth of about 16% from 2020 to reach 2025. So new payment methods have also come into play uh you know e-wallets digital wallets virtual wallets as well as buy now pay later type models that are shifting away um consumer behavior from this traditional cash on delivery type uh, business models and so with mobile electronic and digital payment solutions we are really enabling the implementation of more sophisticated digital physical customer journeys where the payment process itself can be digitized, automated, and even shifted to the background to allow for higher focus on creating customer experiences that are superior. Um, credit cards are among one of the most popular cash alternatives in use today, um, but credit cards alone will not be able to support a cashless society. So as we go into the next normal environment, I believe that although the use of contactless cards and digital wallets will continue to grow, we will see a mix of payment options um, becoming or creating this sort of hybrid cashless society, um, or I would say hybrid cash and cashless society as we move forward into the future. One of the areas that I'm very actively involved in is within uh, the kind of digital economy space. So. Cryptocurrencies or private digital currencies are creating 
new options for exchange of value in this digital economy. And we're seeing um, central bank digital currencies also starting to gain a lot of traction. So CBDCs or central um, bank digital currencies are kind of equated to traditional money, banknotes and coins. But they are kind of the digital or virtual form of this. And this is issued by central banks and it's designed to coexist with our traditional currency. Unlike cryptocurrencies that are decentralized and private, the CD CBDCs are centralized and legal tenders issued by the central banks. So this offers an environment that is less volatile and um, more of a digital option for uh, the general mass or the consumer base. So the digital currency landscape, um, I believe is still in its early days, but it does create significant opportunities and disruption in the global financial ecosystem. For example, it's evident that the growing popularity of metaverses, we've heard a lot about this, this has been in the news quite a lot the past couple of weeks. Um, metaverse is basically a hybrid virtual, um, virtual physical environment that allows us to connect into this um, virtual world using augmented and mixed reality devices to create a 3D version of the internet. So this is taking us into um, what Matthias mentioned a little bit earlier, you know, the current um, situation or the current way the internet is set up um, is going to change a lot as we go into this kind of internet 3.0 or this 3D version of, of the internet environment. And the metaverse also includes its own digital economy where users can buy, create and sell goods. So over the past eight years, we have seen about a 180% increase in consumer spending on virtual and augmented devices to access these virtual metaverse environments. And it's estimated that the metaverse game, mobile games in industry will grow to about 3.1 billion consumer spending by next year. And this acceleration has supported or is supported by advancements in the underlying blockchain and cryptography technology that provides a most secure digital environment for proper exchange of value and commerce. So it's further accelerating the uh, accessibility and use of these sort of 3D environments. Now, despite all of this technology advancements and increase in consumer adoption, there is still, um, as both Matthias and Sherry mentioned, still foundation elements that need to be put in place before we can look forward to a cashless society. So national and regional digital transformation is critical. And here we need to really focus on implementing digital infrastructures that enable broader accessibility to digital payment solutions. As well, we need more uniform regulatory frameworks to govern real-time payments and national payment schemes across the Asian region. So as we find more consumers start to shift into this digital and mobile payment space, we also need to make sure that there's greater um, security, privacy and control of our data as we use these spaces. So the pandemic has really increased inequality between countries as well. And I think this, um, you know, we've seen many research about this topic, but it's estimated that about 300 million people in Southeast Asia, uh, East Asia and Pacific live beyond the reach of standard mobile networks and basic Internet access. So this takes us really to um, you know, foundational issues where on one hand, we have a total acceleration and adoption of these technologies. And on the other hand, we have people falling behind and not getting access to basic necessities. So a cashless society, I believe, will only work once we have these foundational elements, such as digital literacy, accessibility to the internet, cybersecurity, and regulatory and governance framework that have been established in a proper way. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Kavalis. That was uh, quite thought-provoking, and I'm, I'm sure some questions are coming. Uh, some more questions are coming. <clears throat> yeah, and uh, let's let's uh, spar with uh, Lou. Lou Zan, you're in the call. Could yeah. You, could hi. You us? Yes. yes. Yes, I can hear you guys. Yeah, so uh, Kamal has just spoke and uh, maybe you can share your perspectives from in, in addition with sustainability and financial inclusion. Yeah, yeah so thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Amadeep. And also apologize, I'm calling from the West Coast in the United States. 
it's already close to eleven p.m. my time. So good night, everyone. And、uh, because the network is really bad, so it seems like my video is not working. But it's so great to get together uh, uh, with all the fellow panelists. I think they already covered most of the major point. I'd be happy to provide more perspective from the technology innovation angle. So I'm Lu Zhang, the founder and the managing partner of、uh, Fusion Fund. Fusion Fund is a VC firm based in Palo Alto, Silicon Valley, focused on earlier stage deep tech and healthcare investment. So so far, I've been investing across the United States and Canada. We have over 62 portfolio company in the North America. So definitely, you know, digital payment or fintech in general is an area we've been putting lots of capital. And also, lots of adoption of the new technology like AI edge computing provide more advanced solution for us to really smoothly move forward to this cashless society. As other panelists mentioned, COVID definitely push in general all sector go through digital transformation much much faster. And meanwhile, also saw this big issue, especially in United States. People saw US won't have this issue, but actually, US still have a Really sizable population does not really have access to the banking system, to the credit system. So we still have a major issue about financial inclusion in United States. So I remember another.、Um, I remember it.、Uh, Matthias、uh, talk about the issue was、uh, infrastructure, which I hundred percent agree. So we saw lots of、uh, digital payment solution was more focused on innovation on the software layer. How to better provide the user app and also user interface, but if we don't have better infrastructure technology to provide different entry point for all different user, regardless they have a bank account or not, then we won't be able to cover the answerable group. Another thing is really the issue with access. How people could get better access to the system. I think that part partially. We need to do more and more technology enabled solution. Another thing is really relate to in general technology education to the population for them to understand what is the opportunity available there and also what are the technology solution they could potentially benefit from. Recently, we also saw more kind of new solution, not only just just addressing the payment system, but also addressing the credit system. For example, there's a couple of very good performing digital.、Uh, FinTech company, they were kind of focusing on new immigrant group, which not necessary system, and not to mention the credit scores, but they also need funding. So there's lots of more. Build up our credit system. The the traditional way is really based on the past track record, but now with artificial intelligence and also with more sensor technology, we'll be able to collect much more consumer data from a user behavior to be digital user behavior, and be able to have more comprehensive and smart way to give people proper score、uh, based on their different status. So we see all this innovation happening right now, exciting lots of excitement in in the Silicon Valley, and the challenge is really how to. Educate the rest of the country, the rest of the world, about what's going on in the tech side, and how to find a better distribution channel to have all this technology not only just benefit the the population on the coast, but also to the you know Midwest region or even outside the United States. So I think that's the thing you know as a VC investor, we're not only focusing on the financial return, we're also trying to see how we could empower the company generate a much bigger influence. Globally, and me personally, I'm an immigrant from originally from Inner Mongolia. So it definitely has the passion about how to bring the global perspective to lots of tech innovation we're seeing in the Silicon Valley. Uh, thanks, Prasan. Yeah, that was a very interesting perspective as well. And now we have an open set of questions、uh, based since everyone has spoken.、Uh, so where do we go first? Well,、um, maybe Matthias.、Uh, like,、uh, yeah, you you are from Sweden originally, so what, I live in Denmark, Copenhagen, next to it. So RFID chips are like getting inside your body, <laughs> and、uh, so they can be used actually for make making payments. So I have、uh, two friends who do that. So what do you think? Uh, like, uh, could be the next more penetrative、uh, solutions or trends、uh, post COVID. In in this direction, from the technology wise, 
I'm not, I'm not sure. A lot of the companies I work with and the governments are yeah. going away from that more than we're, we're not looking that way, right? We're looking at problems that have happened, which is people have these payment systems, they go into store, the internet is unstable, they cannot hmm. pay, right? That's the kind of problems we're looking at. We're not really looking at like, how do we get new stuff going on? We're trying to fix the stuff there is because digital payments don't work, right? I mean, we have had huge companies that I can't mention because of NDAs, but that are losing money because of digital payments, because of instabilities on the internet, uh, because of broken fiber lines, whatever it is. And it's creating huge disruptions for them in um, their day-to-day business. So it's it's much more about that we are pushing the envelope on trying to get everything to be paid in easier ways because nobody wants to go around with money that's from the past right but there are problems right i mean if if you have a fluctuation in the internet and we all had the 404 show up when we tried to browse the web right and even though people are working on the web3 and all of that stuff right the point is the underlying internet hasn't changed at all there is no internet 3.0 there's a web 3.0 internet is not changing the internet is a protocol that's impossible to change because the cost globally would be like insane right i mean we are talking protocols that are really difficult to update from the border gateway protocol to um, how the TCP work, maybe the TCP is possible, but especially the border gateway protocol would be nearly impossible to update today without trillions of dollars in investments. So we have to accept that we have these problems and start thinking about how can we solve them, right? We, we need to go, the web has the problem of that it's built on top of the internet. It's not the internet, right? It's just an application layer on top of the internet. People think the web is the internet. That's one of the problem because everything they do on the internet is done on the web, right? It's not on the internet. The internet is a protocol below that. And most of the problems we are seeing is in the connection between the web and the internet. The internet was, of course, built by designed that DARPA a long time ago to be decentralized, to make sure that it couldn't be taken down in a, a war and everything, while the web is brutally centralized. I mean, we're talking AWS have, what, 50 server farms in the world? I mean, you can take down the web super simple, right? I mean, if, if we look at it from a decentralized, centralized perspective, it's really mm-hmm. easy to be... Uh, negatively affected. And this is much more where we are working. How can we avoid the cloud technologies? How can we avoid the web technologies to build in and work on the core internet technologies for these kind of solutions to remove the risks that web introduces, right? So that's a lot of it. Even though you can't fully trust the internet, we all know, as I said, it fluctuates, but it is better than the web by far, right? So even if we build the web 3.0, whatever thing we want to call it, it doesn't really help because it's still running on top of the other protocols. So that's where we are mostly working when it comes to these things. So I do not work that much with trying to build new stuff. We're just trying to get the stuff that exists to work properly, right? Because there's too much money being lost on things that don't work properly. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, uh, that, that, that is an interesting take, of course. And um, next I think we have is on uh, uh, <clears throat> Internet of Cash that we always hear about. Uh, has does anybody has some perspective on this this word that which is thrown at us? Uh, maybe Kamalis, uh, anything you you would have heard about uh, Internet of Cash? Um, sure. I mean, I I'd like to speak more about the Internet of Value, which is what we yeah. refer to in terms of digital currencies and exchanges. And I think what we're seeing yeah. a lot happening. Um, you know, the, the space that we're seeing today with this sort of um, digital currencies and um, internet of value environment, I think is uh, there's an increase in significant increase in commerce and capabilities where you can use these digital currencies. 
um, it's creating a great uh, range of innovations that are coming out in this space. And I think that's one of the most exciting things. We're coming away from this traditional environment of um, you know, what the structure is or what the structure should be for financial services and how we engage with each other and the kind of commerce that exists, that has existed for decades, right, for hundreds of years. We're coming away from that and we're looking at an environment where um, we can be more creative around how to create value online and how to buy and sell products and services. I mean, if we just look at the metaverse space, which has, you know, let's let's be very honest, though. It's, it's a hype at the moment with the metaverse. Everyone's talking about it, but it's existed for a while. So if, if I think back to when I first started use, using these sort of digital environments back in 2006, 2007 with um, Second Life, I don't know if anyone remembers Second Life. That was one of the first environments um, that existed. There was significant limitations in terms of what you can use. So back then it was um, very much hyped as well. Uh, people were talking about it. Companies started reviewing how these environments could impact business. But the infrastructure behind it, the capabilities behind it were not very mature. So we didn't have a way to exchange value. We didn't have a way to um, create uh, or the advancements in terms of um, devices. So uh, AR and mixed reality devices to allow us to access these environments. The um, platforms were expensive. The devices were expensive. And as we've evolved over time, all of these elements have kind of fallen into place. And now we have a uh, situation or these fundamental elements that allow us to access these environments more easily at lower cost and more people are using it. So there's a, a real value that individuals can get out of it. And we're seeing a significant shift as well as people move away from traditional jobs and traditional, um, you know, kind of um, revenue or, or income environments into these spaces where they can supplement their income, they can create businesses online that can actually be extremely profitable. So what I find very exciting is this internet of value terminologies being redefined as we speak. And I do believe over the next couple of years, we're not at, at a stable situation. It's still a very much evolving environment. And over the next few years, we'll see this evolution really start to transform take, and take place. And new situations, new digital environments will be created, new value for what uh, or new definitions for what cashless society is and how these digital currencies play a role in these environments. It's going to develop as we go along. I think what we have today is really very early stages and it's going to change and evolve further. What I do believe, though, is, and I think this, this will remain true for the next couple of years, there is a place in society and economy for traditional currencies, for digital currencies, as well as for private current digital currencies, so cryptocurrencies. There is a, a space for all of these elements. There is a need for the variety of, um, of financial transaction capabilities. And this is going to coexist and, and come together in a way that um, we can utilize them in, in kind of a cohesive way. Thanks. And uh, from the sustainability perspective and from the change management as well, and from the financial inclusion, um, I think I mentioned before the El Salvador example of like 70% not having bank accounts and then straight away going for Bitcoin wallets. So, uh, Sherry, maybe you would have some thoughts on uh, is that the way to address uh, financial inclusion in Southeast Asia as well? Yeah, I, I think it's um, really interesting how we're like talking about this problem in a very basic way where uh, Matthias is talking about just pure infrastructure, having proper internet yeah. connections just to pay. And Kamal's talking about, you know, different types of ways of using uh, a cryptocurrency. It's like very, very wide spectrum. And, and what my work is very much focused on is financial inclusion and financial literacy. Um, I think while we're trying to educate people about um, how they should plan for their finances, um, there is this whole lot of change coming up with a new set of asset management um, that we have to deal with. While the fundamentals for a lot of people who are moving out of the poverty cycle, not knowing what to do with even just basic planning, like um, we also have things popping up like uh, buy now and pay later. Um, how do we govern all these all together while not um, causing societal problems? 
um, there's a lot of technology going on, moving fast. But I think governance is also having trouble um, keeping up with those change. Um, and with people who have not been through a um, process of um, his you know, knowledge passed down from their parents on what proper financial planning is with longer longevity periods. We're also finding people not being able to know how to manage their funds. Um, and people jumping into to cryptocurrency out of the blue is uh, is actually quite dangerous. <laughs> I, I, you know, like we were dealing with people who are like, I'm going to invest in, in, in Bitcoin and boom, um, my net just dropped by 20% in a day. Um, and they're crying and they're like, oh, um, it's so easy for me to get invested, to be included, but they yeah. don't have the basic knowledge to deal with that. Um, so there are a lot of different sets of problems in this in this whole topic that we're discussing today that I think in our like 45 minutes is, is, is just That's barely true. scratching the surface. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I mean, may I add one one comment yeah. to that? Because I love yes. the point that Sherry has uh, shared, which is extremely true. Um, I learned about cryptocurrencies by utilizing cryptocurrencies. But I think one one of the things we find extremely true is people jump on a hype, and there is a, a significant amount of value in learning about these environments, why they're different, and how they function. And with it comes uh, dangers around. Um, the the cybersecurity, data privacy, and access, and you know hacking and things like that. So there's a lot in this environment that users need to learn about. Which, um, in from one sense, you know, it it really creates uh, gives more control back to the user around your financial um, management or personal finances. So I think this is for me. This was a great learning because over the last six seven years, I've developed that education around this for myself. But it is something that I, I do believe as a novice, you can't just jump in. You need to educate yourself first. So thank you for sharing that, Sherry. Thank you. Hi. Uh, yeah, I really love what you two. Uh, um, could I jump in? Amanda, yes. could I jump in? Yes. Yeah, so, you know, I think it's a, definitely a super popular topic. I really like uh, the fellow two analysts that mentioned about uh, we need to be careful about cryptocurrency because I know it's a super fancy idea and talking about, you know, decentralized and uh, get rid of government. And it seems like that's a representative of the underrepresentative. But the reality is, as I mentioned at the beginning, you know, the amount of allocation we need to do for people to truly understand that the nature of the cryptocurrency is even more than understanding the existing banking system. So that's the first thing other panelists mentioned that it's kind of dangerous for people just jumping out of blue. Another thing is I know people, lots of people talk about blockchain all the time. Like we haven't invested any blockchain company so far, but we've been studying since 2017. I also have friends, they try to set up, you know, the whole banking system for some very small country in Africa, try to leverage the blockchain. But the reality is the technology is not there yet. I know people like the potential future and the vision that decentralized the system, et cetera. But no matter uh, Libra from Facebook or other trial by the other institute, you can find out now they're now doing a decentralized system. It's a centralized distributed network because fundamentally decentralized could not guarantee the transaction volume and the efficiency. That's the fundamental bottleneck for blockchain right now. Another misunderstanding people has for blockchain is like deployment and uh, deployment of technology would be pretty cheap. Actually, that's not. <laughs> Based on my friend's experience, try to set up so, so called like the banking system for this uh, smaller country who does not have existing banking system leverage. Blockchain is actually very expensive, very complicated. In that case, you know, I kind of feels like uh, this buzzword make us feel like, OK, this might be the potential solution for the financial inclusion. But on the other side, I kind of feel like it's not a solution. In a certain way, they probably really prevent us to really push the true technology solution who could help us with the financial inclusion. So I think go back to what I mentioned early on, the understanding the basic status of the technology and the truth of it, the commercialization stage of it, is very critical. Otherwise, uh, there's too many buzzwords flying around on the market and it's very easy to, to capture lots of attention, including the capital, to jump into it right away. Yeah, th thanks for that. And uh, I guess we all have run out of the time right now. 
but it was lovely getting all your perspectives whether the checkbook stays or it goes disappears like a floppy disk or whether the internet uh, or web uh, reborn um, we going to notice but it's very interesting to get all these perspectives and i thank you everyone for joining this panel we should stay in touch and we'll come back again thank you so much thank you so much yes thank, thank you, you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day or a great evening yes. Yes. Great depending on where you are <laughs> yeah good bye. day tonight bye, bye.